Shalom Torah fans and welcome back to Purim, the making of the King's Bride. Tonight, you wanna put that gallows where? Well, tonight we are going into the third part of this five part teaching on the Megillah of Hadassah or the scroll of Esther or Easter as uh, she would be known in the English language. And tonight we're going to be in Easter chapter three, verse one. And so please turn your Bibles there. Uh, Our whole story started out in the third year of Akashverosh, and it is at the end of a six month world's fair in which there is a seven day feast. At the culmination of this feast, this is when Vashti, which means absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, she is then asked by the emperor to be brought in with the royal crown in a display of the most magnificence of the empire, and she insults the emperor, uh, which is not allowed to stand. In the whole course of events, we see that after she insults her husband, she uh, is then put out from being the queen, and uh, that pretty well ends the problem that we had with Vashti in the first chapter, but then the king is looking for a bride. We see that there is a young Jewish girl that is named Hadassah, that in the sixth year of the reign of uh, Akashveros, that is when she is then selected for the one year purification process, and with all the other young virgins in the empire, they are then brought in They are groomed, they are trained, they are prepared for that one year, and at the end of that one year, that is when Akashvaros says, I found my queen, Hadassah. He only knew her as Easter, which is the name of the Babylonian goddess of fertility, but this is in secret, no one knew that she was actually Jewish. And so we see that her cousin, Mordecai, who had raised her, Mordecai, which means little, he's kind of in the background, kind of insignificant, little, but yet he was the one that raised her and said, don't let anyone know who your people are. Well, it was during the seventh year of the reign of Akashveros, or shortly thereafter, that two of the doorkeepers in the emperor's palace are making a plot to kill the emperor. Mordecai finds out relates the information to Easter, then she makes it known to her husband, and so this is circumvented, the men are executed, they are hung, and we now move into chapter three, because we're gonna see the hand of the Almighty is so prevalent in the book of Adasa. He is moving things, yet his name is not mentioned. And Easter chapter three, verse one, after these things did King Akashveros promote Haman, which means the magnificent. The son of Hamaditha, it says in your King James, but it is literally ha Maditha, the doubled. The king, uh, the son of the doubled, the Agagite, the Agagite. And he advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And so now, this is after the time of Daniel, and as Daniel was a satrap, or the the head uh, under Darius, now we have under Xerxes, we have Haman, the magnificent one, who is an Agagite. And he is the one who is put in this position. Now, we are going to understand why there are all these boring genealogies in the Bible. They're not really boring at all. It's just that we have to know enough about the scriptures to know how important they are. And we see that uh, to understand the relationship between Mordecai and Haman and what is about to happen between the Jew and this Agagite, we have to go back to Esther 2.5. It says, in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. Now, it doesn't give us all the generations here. As a matter of fact, it leaves out like 490 years. But it lets us know that Mordecai, that it goes all the way back to being a son of Kish, which is over 490 years earlier of Benjamite. Now, this shows that, that this is an unbroken lineage, even though it doesn't describe every single generation that is there. Uh, we also see this in the, uh, in the book of Matthew, 
where there are 14 generations from uh, Abraham to David, uh, 14 generations from David to the carrying way into Babylon, and 14 generations from the carrying way unto Babylon, unto the Messiah. And we hear uh, some of the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-missionaries uh, the a Jewish anti-missionary said, "Well, the your, your scripture is not true because it doesn't have all of the uh, all the, the the lineage there." No, of course it doesn't. It gives exactly fourteen generations. It makes an internal masora between th- in this pocket of generations fourteen, fourteen, and fourteen, so that we see that it is unbroken. There is no question, and they have to admit that it is an unbroken lineage. But yet there are three kings that are left out from this lineage. Why? Because there is an internal masora being made of fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. It doesn't mean that there were only 14, it means it lists 14, and here are the names of these 14, so that when we get to Yeshua, we can find out that in the English and in the Greek text, that they mistranslated a word that completely destroyed the lineage of Yeshua. In the Hebrew Matthew, and also in the Aramaic, uh, it is maintained, it's correct. But the Greeks mistranslated something. It was then worsened by in the English versions of the Bible. And so no longer do you have 14, 14, 14. So I'm just saying that, that the standard that they use, oh, your Bible can't be true. You know, the, the gospel lineage can't be true uh, because there are three kings missing. Oh, we got 490 years of people that are missing from the lineage of Kish. And who's one of the sons of Kish? Saul, the first king of Israel. So we are looking, ladies and gentlemen, Mordecai, almost, almost royalty. And as it tells in 2 Samuel 16, 5 uh, through 8, out of the family of the house of Saul, there came a man whose name is Shimei, the son of Gerah. This is Shaul, or King Saul's brother. And so we see that Mordecai literally comes from Saul's brother, who then has, uh, has a son named Shimei, and that is the lineage of Mordecai. But we are still in the household of Saul, of, uh, of, of the son of Kish. And so now I wanna go back to this, uh, the, the storyline of, of Hadassah here. And to understand about this lineage of both Saul, the son of Kish, and this Agagite. In 1 Samuel 51, it says, Samuel said unto Saul, Thus saith Yahovah of O, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he waited, laid in wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek. Utterly destroy all that they have, spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant, suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And we covered this in our last session of exactly who the Amalekites were. But what I did not bring out was that who the Amalekites actually, uh, what the offspring line is. Because we find this in Genesis. Turn to Genesis 36, 12, and we see that Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz. Eliphaz was Esau's son, and Timnah bare to Eliphaz Amalek. And so Amalek is actually a grandson of Esau who went forth and dwelt with the, the cursed Canaanites, which they are known for their, their gross immorality, murdering sex perversion. That's what they're known for. Uh, and that is why uh, when we have these uh, Amalekites dwelling with them, uh, nothing good is going to come out of these Amalekites either. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses seven, we're going to continue reading. So Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah till you come to Shur that is over against Mitzrayim or Egypt. But he took Agag, Agag, now remember that Haman is a, an Agagite. His father is an Agagite. But he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs, all that was good, and he would not utterly destroy them. And so Samuel then went back to Saul in verse 26 and says, Yehovah has rejected you from being king over Israel because he did not do 
what he was told to do. He was told to completely obliterate these people. But the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, and Agag the king, and it's not just Agag the king, it's his family, okay? Because the Agagites are gonna continue on. Okay, he's brought Agag, and, and it says that, that as Samuel turned about to go away, Shaul laid hold of, upon the skirt of his mantle. In the King James, in the New Testament, read the hem of his garment, but you know, in the, uh, from the Hebrew, it reads the, the uh, skirt of his mantle. This is the seat seat, grabbing onto the seat seat on the hem of his garment, and it tore, it ripped it off. And Samuel said unto him, Yehovah hath rent the kingdom of Israel from you this day. It's over. And it was over. Because he made excuse after excuse, and finally the excuses ran out. This one thing, and just as the Almighty said, in Exodus 17, 16, Yahweh has sworn that he will make war with Amalek from generation to generation. See, this is why Saul was put on the job. You take him out now. I have sworn I will make war against them. Because of what they did, this will not be forgotten. Now they continue to do it. Now you take care of business. And because Saul refused to take care of business and he saved the best alive, now, hundreds of years later, in Babylon, the number one man in the empire under the king is the offspring of Agag, an Amalekite. Now we're going to see the plot thicken. Now we're in verse 2. And all the king's servants, this is back in Hadassah chapter three, verse one, all the king's servants were in the, that were in the king's gate, they bowed and reverenced Hegde's magnificence, Haman, for the king had commanded concerning him. He said that everyone will bow down and respect him. He's my number one man. He's on my right hand. You respect him like you respect me. But Mordecai, the little man, he refused to bow, nor did he Give him any respect. Oh, we know what Haman felt like Rodney Dangerfield. Got, he got absolutely no respect from the little man. Then the king's servants, which are in uh, the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's commandment? And now in a verse it's going to say that he told him he was a Jew, but you know, that's shorthand. He probably said, well, let me tell you a little story about this Agagite, about Haman, and about my great, 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 grand uncle. Let me tell you what happened. And let me tell you what the Amalekites did to us when we were coming out of Egypt. Let me give you the background. And so he told the story, and then finally, they understood, but they said, it doesn't really matter. You're not living in the land of Israel. Your king didn't do his job, but now this man is in charge of the empire under Xerxes, under Akashverosh. So it came to pass, in verse four, when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, then they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, because he, he told him, Mordecai told him that he was a Jew and gave him the background. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow nor reverence him, and it's like bowing down and reverencing Arafat, or, or, and, and uh, bowing down and negotiating with his Baala, his Baala. Now they don't quite pronounce it like that on the news, but you know these are the murdering followers of Allah, the fictitious moon god invented by Muhammad, okay? Or Hamas, the destroyers, okay? No respect. No respect. And he thought evil to lay hands on Mordecai alone. But when they, the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, had shown in the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. He said, I'm not just gonna take out Mordecai, I'm gonna kill them all. Because now he knows 
These are the people that nearly wiped them out. These are the people that my ancestors, because listen, 127 prophets, 127 kingdoms. This is the top of the kingdom of what's left of the Amalekites. And now he's sitting at the top of the empire of the Persian empire. So he just sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the entire kingdom of Akashverosh, even all the people of Mordecai. So in the first month, that is the month Nisan, now really, the month is not named Nisan until right here, right now, once we are in Babylon, then we are picking up the Babylonian names of these months. But the first month is the month of the Aviv. Now in your King James Version, it'll say the month of Abib. Okay, I don't care whether you pronounce it with the, with the, with the vet or the bet, it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, Jews today pronounce it with the vet, okay, Aviv. But it is always Ha-Aviv. There is no month called Abib or a month called Abib. No, it's the month of the Aviv, and it begs the question, the Aviv what? Because Aviv is an ancient Hebrew agricultural term that describes the maturity of the crop known as barley. It only refers to barley. And we find out that when the barley is aviv, that is when we celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread because during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we present the first fruits of the barley harvest. And the barley must be aviv before you can present the first fruits. And that's why we have to occasionally add on a 13th month in order to allow the barley to mature. That's why each year we do not know when Passover is going to be until the end of the 12th month, the first sliver of the new moon appears and the barley is aviv, then we celebrate Passover that month. If not, then we put it off for a month. But now, it is the month of the of Nisan, as it's known in, in, uh, in Babylon, in the 12th year of King Akashverosh. So now Hadassah has been queen now for five years. And that is the month that they cast poor. That is the lot. So there was a lot that they cast. This is a, kind of a, a way of choosing. You know, you can do a three-man way, and that's, you know, uh, uh, what's that, a stone and paper and scissors, okay. You know, this is the way that uh, uh, some people cast lots. But it says that they cast poor, that is a lot, before Haman from day to day, from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month of Dar. Now, let's just take a look at this. Let's use the simplest way for deciding something. This is how they start out NFL games, with the simplest possible way of figuring out who is going to kick off and who's going to receive which end of the field uh, that they uh, commence play from. They use a simple coin toss. And if we start right now at the first month, and then we are going to start, and we flip a coin, which is the simplest way, and we flip that coin because we're just looking for heads to come up once. The first time heads come up, Boom, that's the month that we are going to put in plan, uh, place a plan. And what the plan is to exterminate all the Jews. That's what it is. And so it comes up for the first six months, the first six times they flip the coin. First six times, it's never heads. The chance of that happening is one in 10.67. And you know, and every month they flip it and it doesn't come up, they're starting to think, you know, something's wrong with this coin. Now this is the simplest thing. If, it, if it's doubled, if it's like two things that have to come up together at the same time, black and white, and both of them have to come up at the same time, then the odds significantly multiply exponentially from there. But let's just do the simplest thing because this is showing that the hand of the Almighty is working in this very thing. In the whole history of time, we are going to see that actually things in the book of Daniel are going to be based upon the events of Purim. And it's all back in the days of Haman, a simple coin toss. And so now, he finally gets to the 11th month, and for the first time, it comes off heads. 
the chances is one in 186.2 times. It's showing us the hand of the Almighty is in here because it's going all the way around the year to the final month. This is going to give the greatest amount of time for all these things to transpire. And now we found the month and now it's going to be flipped. The lot is going to be cast. And again, we don't know exactly how the lot is done. I'm giving you just the simplest version, a coin toss. And now it's on the 13th. And so on the 13th, it's one in 620.5 chances, one in 620.5 that it wouldn't come up heads until the 13th day. And so now we are hopefully either at the end of this segment or next segment, we're going to get into Daniel's sealed prophecies because the Almighty is in charge of the coin toss. Worst case scenario, that this will have to end up being one of the DVDs to our Ambassador Club members out there. But let's go on, in verse eight. And Haman said unto Akashrosh, there's a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, neither do they keep the king's law. Therefore it's not for the king's prophet to suffer. You know, the guy's just a liar, okay? You know, the, 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 the Jews in the land have been nothing but good uh, for the entire empire. And he said, oh, these people, they, they don't respect your laws. Why? Because they live on a higher level. You know, it's like um, uh, uh, John Adams. Or excuse me, Samuel Adams. Uh, who said that we're not basing the future of America upon the Constitution, far from it, we're basing it upon every man's ability to govern himself according to the commandments of God. Because if you govern yourself according to the commandments of God, you are living on a higher level. You don't need to make laws for these people. Now we have 2.4 million laws in America. Why? People simply will not govern themselves according to the Torah of God. No. You know, we've been taught in our schools that there is no God. It's survival of the fittest. If it feels good, do it. Oh, this is post-Christian America. Uh, if you people have not heard yet, oh yes, our president has announced it. It's a, this is no longer just a Christian uh, country. You know, we've got all sorts of, uh, of twisted religious perversion out there that is now acceptable, okay? I mean, you know, even cults that call for the murder of everyone that's not in them, that's now acceptable. Oh, that's, that's actually a, a, a very revered uh, religion in America. No one dares say anything about this sick, twisted, murdering religion because the president's in bed and bows down to their leaders, okay? In bed with them, that's a figure of speech, okay? But now... We, we take a look at this, and he's just lying. Haman's a liar. Yeah, yeah, th this, there is no honor in this magnificent person at all. Not a bit of honor is due him, and that's why Mordecai refuses to even look his way. He wouldn't even spit his way if he had to go out of his way. Therefore, it's not the king's prophet to, to allow them to continue. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed and this is what I'll do. I'll pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. You know, a typical Washington, D.C. payoff. That's why, now actually, there's one, um, one state that doesn't have to go under Obamacare because the deal was made with the senator if he would sign the bill that his state would be exempt because they couldn't do it honestly. It's a multi-million dollar payoff, ladies and gentlemen. See, these things are, are real. He's paying off the king. He's putting so much into the king's coffers. And the king then, seeing he was serious, took the ring off his right hand, which is the signet ring, and he gave it to Haman, the son of the doubled, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver, it's yours. The people also... Do 
with them as it seems good to thee, because it's gonna take some finances to pull this whole thing off. And he says, okay, all the money that you've given, I'm gonna give you charge of it, you make sure that this is done. I believe that you're telling me the truth, we need to uh, take care of these Jews. We've got the United Nations, everything is backing you right now, 127 provinces all on your side. And then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, to the governors, and to every, that were in every province, to the rulers of the people of every kingdom, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of the king, it was written and sealed with the king's ring, because the king's ring was on the finger of the magnificent Haman. And letters were sent by post to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, young and old, little children and women. And one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoils of your prey. And this is what we see in the uh, Europe's version of this, Hitler's version of it, in the Museum of the Extinct Race, uh, the great um, uh, film out there, documentary, The Rape of Europa, to see exactly the, what was done, uh, the absolute murder of millions and millions of Jews, the plundering of everything that they had, and this was what the plan was back then. So the copy of the writing for a command was given in every province to be published unto all the people that they should be ready against that day. So the post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the cre decree was given in Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink some Corvassier exo cognac, but the city of Shushan was in absolute turmoil. And when, chapter four, verse one, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, he rent his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and a bitter cry. And you could imagine the torment in his soul because he knows that he's responsible. He could have just kept his mouth shut, so to speak, and bowed to Haman like everyone else and pretended that everything was okay. But no, he spoke up. And now they are going to not only kill him, but they're gonna kill every living Jew in the empire, which means the world would be Judenrei. There would be no Jews left. This is exactly the position of Hamas and Hezbollah, Hezbollah. This is their position now. It is illegal to enter into the king's gate where, where Mordecai was allowed to go because of his position, but it was illegal to go in clothed in sackcloth and ashes. So Mordecai stayed outside and the entire empire, wherever this decree went, everyone, all the Jews were in great mourning. They were fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. They had one year left before the death sentence would be executed and there was nothing they could do about it. They were unarmed. They were living in the civilian population of the empire of, uh, the, uh, of Babylon. So Easter's maids and her chamberlains came and told her the situation with Mordecai, that he's out there, your cousin is out there in sackcloth and ashes outside of the king's gate. Then the, the queen was exceedingly grieved. This is not, this does not look good politically. And she rent, sent raiment to clothe them and, and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received them not. Then Easter called Hatak, which means truth, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. What, what is going on here? So Hatak went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened unto him, the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasures to destroy the Jews. Also, Mordecai gave Hatak a copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to show it to Easter, and to declare to her and charge her that she should go unto the king to make supplication unto him and to request before him for all her people. And Hatak came and told Easter the words of Mordecai. 
Again, Easter spoke unto Hatak and gave commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the province, everybody knows that whoever, whether man or woman, whoever shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is just one law. You put him to death, except to whom the king shall hold forth the golden scepter, that he may live. But I've not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Well, Hadass has now been queen for five years. She may be a little past her prime, and he's got, you know, perhaps thousands of concubines. And so, you know, you know she's, she's, you know, she's not, uh, not first on the list here uh, for the last 30 days. And they told Mordecai Easter's words. Then Mordecai commanded, okay, you tell my cousin this. Do not think that you will escape because you're in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you hold your plea, peace at this time, there shall be an enlargement. There shall be a greatness and deliverance arise to the Jews from some other place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. And who knows whether you have come into the kingdom that everything that has happened to you in your whole life your parents being killed, me raising you, you, me then helping you, and you getting into the gang's house, and now that you are the queen, how do you know that all this didn't happen? That Vashti didn't refuse to come in before the king and all this stuff, that the whole fabric of life wasn't so that this moment was designedly designed by the Almighty that all this happened, that you would be in the king's palace for such a time as this. Then, Easter bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Fast for me. Do not eat and do not drink for three days, day or night. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go unto the king, which is against the law. If I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Easter had commanded him. Chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Easter put on a royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Easter, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Easter the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Easter drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said unto her, and I'm sure she was like, you know, this is after three days of no eating and no drinking. Her life is on the line. And he said, come dear. Then the king said, what wilt thou, Queen Easter? What is your request? It shall be given unto thee, even to the half of the kingdom. And she said, well, that sounds like a pretty good divorce settlement. Uh, That's, uh, let's see, uh, 63.5 empires, uh, kingdoms. I'll take that. No, it's a figure of speech. It is a magnanimous offer of royalty, even to the half of my kingdom. Do you think he would really give the half of his kingdom if she said it? No, there's no way on God's green earth. This is just royal fluff. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou? Unto the half of my kingdom? And Easter answered in verse 4, If it seem good to the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. And the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Easter has said. He said, Yes, dear, we'll be at your banquet. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Easter had prepared, just the two of them. Now, What does she know? We don't know what she knows because she's been praying and fasting and we know that you're going to watch divine revelation unfold here. You want to know how to walk by the Spirit? Read the book of Easter. 
And the king said unto Easter at the wine and cheese party, it says a banquet of wine, what is your, your petition? And what will be granted thee? What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, and it shall be performed. Anything you want, sweetheart, it's yours. Just ask. Just say the word. Here, here, here's a blank check. Just fill it out. I'll sign it. No problem. What do you want? Then Easter answered and said, my petition and request is, if I found favor in your sight, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. See, now this is what we, what in Shaul, in the Brit Hadashah, in 1 Corinthians, refers to as word of knowledge and word of wisdom. One of the, uh, these are two of the, manifestations of the Spirit. See, when the Spirit gives information whereby you could not know it by the senses realm, this is what we put in the category of revelation, divine revelation. But see, she doesn't tell the king what the revelation is. See, she gets the revelation, this is word of knowledge. It is a word, it's a, okay, this is what you do. And the word of wisdom is how to carry it out. She doesn't tell the king, she tells nobody. It's information for her, for her alone to act on, and if she does it right, then we're gonna see the result. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful, and with a glad heart, he has just been invited, it's only the emperor, and only him, it's like, he walks out, it's, he's at the top of his game. He walks out, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my, and then there's Mordecai. Mordecai, this dupe, this disrespectful jerk, the man who gives me no respect. He I can't stand this man. As soon as he walks out, he saw Mordecai in the king's gate. He didn't stand up. He didn't move for him. He was full of indignation. Nevertheless, he restrained himself. He wanted to strike out. He wanted to take out his scimitar and strike him down right then. But he, no, he's holding it back. And when he came home, he called for his friends. And he called Zeresh, his wife. Zeresh is Persian for Goldie. So from now on, we're just gonna call her Goldie, okay? So he called his friends and called Goldie and Haman told him of the glory of his riches, his magnificence. That's why my name is the Magnificent One. I am Haman the Magnificent. Everybody bows down to me. I am the top one in the entire empire. Look at all my children and all the things that the king has promoted me. He showed him his ribbons, his badges, his notoriety, his honor that he had received. And he had been advanced among all the princes and servants of the king in verse 12. And Haman said, yes, even Easter the queen, let no man come in with the king under the banquet except me, myself. There is nobody greater. I am the greatest. And tomorrow I'm invited also under her with the king and no one else is coming. Yet all this avails me nothing as long as I see Mordecai, this Jew, sitting in the king's gate. Then said Goldie, his wife, and all his friends, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, and tomorrow speak unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Now, when reading this, first of all, the first thing you have to do is get out of your mind that the word gallows is some kind of place where a 13-knotted hangman's noose from the Old West is positioned on this beam with a trap door, and that this whole thing apparatus is up 50 feet high, and that Haman is going to then hang Mordecai around the neck. 
The word gallows here in Hebrew is simply the word wood. He caused the wood to be made. A wood 50 feet high. Now, let's go back to Genesis for just a moment. Genesis 40, 22, it says that Pharaoh hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Remember, in the prison, there was a butler and a baker, and the butler, the one that gave the the wine uh, into the king's hand, was restored to his position, but the baker said that in three days you're gonna be hanged. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean hang with a hangman's noose. No, hanging in Egypt, as in, and and this was part of uh, Egypt now, you know, this is much, much later, but remember, from Ethiopia to the Indus River, all the way to Greece, this is what they did. They had wood that was sharpened and they hung people on this sharpened wood that came up to a slender point and people were then hung on it. Now, how were they hung on? Let's continue on. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 26, we read, Joshua smote them, slew them, and then hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon trees until the evening. Now, the, the word trees, as soon as you see this in your mind, you have a picture of, of, of regular trees, but it's the word eights. And you just look it up in, in a Strong's Concordance, which is really one of the most simple, um, you know, even elementary, it's elementary, it's not, even, it's not even high school, okay? A Strong's Concordance is an elementary concordance. It's among the simplest concordances you can get. And even there, it says tree, wood, timber, stock, plank, stalk, stick, gallows. And when the word gallows comes up, it is referring to an impaling stake. They killed these people and then hung their dead bodies on these impaling stakes for all to see. In Ezra 6.11, it says, I've made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let them be hanged thereon, and let his house be a dunghill for this very thing. Whoever alters this word, let timber be pulled down from their house, and let them be hanged on it. How do you hang people on timber pulled down from their house? You build a gallows or an impaling stake, and then you impale these people on the stake. And then let their house be a dunghill. And what do they do? All the openings they close up, the second story they open up, and then burrow down, make a hole in the in the second floor, down into the bottom, and that is becomes literally the dunghill, or for that village, it's the public latrine. This is what will be done to their house. If this is what's done to your house, ladies and gentlemen, This is the ultimate disgrace for your family. You know, that means pretty much your family's been completely destroyed and everyone's memory of you is, oh yeah, uh, that's the Jacob's uh, latrine that you have heard about. You know the Jacob's latrine? Oh yes, the ones that used to work for the king? Oh yes, the old Jacob's latrine. Hmm, okay. Now we understand, make his house a dunghill. Now to understand this, uh, uh, this impaling, because see, to, for the timber to be then set up into a paling stake 50 feet high, it is uh, Herodotus that said that, that Darius, the father of Xerxes, hung over 3,000 Babylonians when he took the city. He impaled them. He didn't hang them on hangman's noose. He says that he impaled them. Now, how is this generally done? Well, if you really want to exhibit some excruciating pain, you don't impale the people first. First of all, you arrest them. Then, like his design for Mordecai, is to then tie his hands behind his back. And then, upon this scaffolding, they would then go up and then they would seat this person on this sharpened impaling stake. Seat him on a needle point 
impaling stake that then gets bigger and bigger as it expands out. Even if he didn't, his hands were not tied, a man seated on an impaling stake would be in such excruciating pain for hours, and it doesn't matter how strong you are to reach underneath you and to try to pry yourself off from an impaling stake 50 feet high to where everyone sees you. This is an example to the whole world. This is what happens to the enemies of Haman. At 50 cubits, this is like 75 feet tall. This is twice as tall as a telephone pole. So imagine a city street telephone pole sharpened to a needle point and then finally broadening out to about this big at five feet down, you would hope you would die in the first five or six hours. But every time you moved, every muscle twitch, every relaxation, everything that you did, that point would go deeper and deeper and deeper. And if it missed your heart and then took out one of your lungs, and then went up into your throat and finally your brain. Whew, man. You want to put that gallows where? Ladies and gentlemen, give me a 13 knotted hangman's noose from the Old West any day. Do not let me die on the gallows of Haman. Well, this brings us into the Brit Hadashah, in fact. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 3, because uh, this gives us an idea of what it means when it says that these people would be hanged. Joshua hung them on these trees, on these impaling stakes, that let timber be brought, let their house be assembled, take the roof off, make this a public latrine, and then the roof timbers, sharpen them, and then impale these people on them, if they break the Torah. You know, he's getting serious now in Ezra. You know, these people have got to get back in line. And so it says that the battle went sore in 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 3. The battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was gravely wounded by the archers. Sore wounded, it's more than just sore. I mean, it's, it, it, this means gravely. He was wounded unto death. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, draw your sword, thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was deathly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword, fell upon it, and that is when Saul hanged himself. He hung himself on his sword. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day, they all died together. Now, I want to take you into the book of Acts. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, verse 39. And it says, and we are all witnesses of these things, which he did. Yeshua did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Now we come into Roman times, ladies and gentlemen. They slew him, they hung him on a tree. And uh, th this uh, tree is a Zulan, Zulan, in, uh, in your Strong's Concordance, number 3586. And whenever people use strong concordance numbers, it drives me nuts. So I just did it. Because Strong's numbers are not the Bible. It goes Strong's number this, that. No. They quote it like it's some big authority. It's the juvenile version of a concordance, okay? But wood, A, that which has been made from wood, 1A1, one as a beam from which one is suspended a gibbet, a cross. Now we know that Yeshua was hanged on a tree. Was he impaled on a gallows? No, because now we are in Roman times. They don't impale people. They hang them on a cross. 
Ah, let's, uh, let, let's go into this. In John 19, 31. Therefore the Jews, because it was a preparation so that the bodies would not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Because it was the preparation. The preparation to what? Well, it's the preparation of the Passover. And this is what it tells us in the same chapter, in verse 19, uh, 14 of John 19, it was a preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. Pilate said unto the Jews, behold your king. It's the preparation of Passover. Now this word cross is the word in Greek staros. And staros, according to Strong's, Number one is an upright stake, especially a pointed one. It could be an impaling stake. Was Yeshua impaled on a stake? It gave us a description of it. He was nailed to a staros. Number two, a cross. Why would they use the word staros, which could also be cross? Because this is what the Romans did. They worshiped Mithra. The sign of Mithra was the Babylonian T or Tau for the cross of Mithra or the cross of Tammuz, Tammuz, the Babylonian Tau. A well-known instrument of the most cruel and ignominious punishment borrowed by the Greeks and Romans from the Phoenicians to what were fixed among the Romans down to the time of Constantine the Great, the guiltiest criminals, particularly the basest slaves. This is Strong's uh, his description here. So you see that one place it says that he was hanged on a tree. Oh, and so now, oh, we use this one example. Okay, well, Jesus, it was a growing tree, and Jesus was actually on a growing tree. That's one usage of it. You've got to look at the culture, people. Josephus said at one time they had 2,000 Jewish men in chains waiting for the next cross to become available because it took up to a week to die on a cross. And so now this person dies, they hang the next one. They knew what a cross was. You can't turn it into a tree. You can't turn it into a gallows at this particular point. And then, now we read in Matthew 27, 5. Judas cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that he built a gallows, like in the Old West, got a 13 knotted hangman's noose, and hanged himself? No. We've got to go with what is going on, what is the culture. Acts 1, 18 says, Judas, uh, and this is uh, uh, Peter, Kepha, Give us the detail. Judas purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known in all of Jerusalem as a gross hematos, or akeldama, or the field of blood. It was a bloody, gory mess. Now, how could that happen if he was hung by an Old West 13 knotted hangman's noose? It wouldn't. How did he hang himself? He took his sword, he put the hilt on the ground, just like King Saul did, and he hung himself on his sword. He impaled himself on his sword. Remember the light of, night of the Last Supper? Yeshua asked his disciples if they ever lacked anything during his, his, uh, the time he sent them out in ministry. They said no. He said, okay, I'm telling you, if you got a coat, extra coat, sell it. If you got money, go out and buy yourself a sword. Now, go, do. Of course, no, it wasn't the last supper, it wasn't the Passover meal. He just sent his disciples to go out and buy swords or to sell something in Aaron's Park and Pawn and buy a sword. And, and Peter said, well, we've got two here already. Judas may have been one of them. And they said, that's enough. We're not trying to take over the world here. Two's enough. But Judas took his sword and he impaled himself on it. And all of his bowels gushed out. And it was well known in Jerusalem, that place was known as the field of blood. See, ladies and gentlemen, the words in your English version of the Bible had to be interpreted 
in light of their biblical usage, not just at the time of translation, but in their historical usage as well. All these things must be understood in order for us to get the proper context. And now we see in ancient Persia, under the reign of Akashverosh, Xerxes, that Haman and Agagai, the enemy of the Jews from the moment we walked out of Egypt, these murderers are now trying to murder us again and to wipe us all out in the first one that has got to go. He is not going to be satisfied until a 75 foot tower with a pointed beam and he has Mordecai, the Jew, seated upon it with that gallows protruding up inch by inch, hour after hour. Now we're going to find out if one of the most powerful, one of the wealthiest men in the world, one who has the signet ring and can make anything happen in the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the New World Order of Xerxes, is going to have his way with a little Jew. Now I would like to leave you with this blessing. Yivarechecha Yehovah Vayishmarecha. Yair Yehovah Panavilecha Vichunecha. Yisa Yehovah Panavilecha Vayisem Lecha Shalom. Vashem Yeshua. Sar Shalom. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to be shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua.